happy and healthy intimate relationship requires two people who are willing to practice relational self-awareness, being able to understand your thoughts and your feelings and why you view love the way that you do, helps you choose a partner who's healthy for you, practice healthy boundaries, and then deal with the inevitable bumps in the road. But did you know that self-awareness can also help you in the bedroom? In this video, I'm gonna provide you with three questions you can ask yourself in order to deepen your sexual self-awareness. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I'm a couples therapist, professor, and author who's passionate about giving people the tools and paradigms they need to create happy and healthy, intimate relationships. So, relational self-awareness is this big umbrella about your relationship to relationships. The patterns that you bring in, the beliefs, the frameworks based on your culture, based on your family experiences that shape how you experience and do intimate relationships. And it's important. It's the essential foundation for loving and being loved. But your self-awareness, your relational self-awareness is going to be incomplete unless you cultivate a happy and healthy relationship with your sexuality, your sexual self. So sexual self-awareness is your willingness to understand, explore with curiosity and compassion who you are as a sexual person. Why? Why do we need sexual self-awareness? Because sex is freaking complicated. Sex is two things at the very same time. It's a behavior, right? Or better said, it's a set of erotically charged behaviors. At the very same time, sex is a gateway into some of the deepest longings that we experience as human beings. The longing for power, for security, for connection, for validation, for meaning, for pleasure, for escape. And these deep longings matter. They matter a lot. Our deep longings, the interior of what gets stirred in us, is what gives color and richness and meaning to our lives. But those deep longings can also be overwhelming. So the commitment to practicing sexual self-awareness gives you the tools that you need to know that a deep longing is being stirred and to be able to address that deep longing rather than pushing it away or acting out on it. So by practicing sexual self-awareness, turning again and again to paying attention to what gets stirred up in you, that's what helps you make choices that are respectful to yourself and to other people and that are joyful, that feel good to you and to your sexual partner. So I'm gonna provide you with three questions that you can use to deepen your sexual self-awareness. Before we start that, I wanna make sure that I say that based on how you grew up, this may all be brand new for you. If you grew up in a home where sex was taboo, you may feel like you're on quite a big learning curve. Don't worry about that. The beautiful thing is that you are forever growing and changing anyways, so you have to practice self, sexual self-awareness not just once, but really as a way of life going forward. So it doesn't matter where we start as long as we get on the path and become increasingly, cur increasingly curious about who we are and why we respond to the world around us in the ways that we do. So with these three questions, you can do one of two things or both of these things. You could journal in response to these questions, or you could use these questions as a springboard to a conversation with a trusted friend or with your intimate partner. Question number one, how do you learn about sex? So with this question, what I'd like you to do is tell the story of your sex education, your memories. How did you first learn what sex was? Who told you? How did they tell you? Did you discover it via pornography or discover it some other way? What was the context in which you, in which you learned? What was the, the energy or the tone of those initial early conversations about sex? Were they infused with love and care and wholeheartedness? Or were you taught in a way that was very fear loaded about uh, danger and sin and risk? So, so the way to start with this is to just sort of name it, sort of tell the story of it, write about it or talk with a friend about it. 
And notice as you sit with that story, the series of memories that are about those early kinds of experiences, that early template, notice the feelings that stir inside of you. What I have found as I have sat with people over the years talking about this question of how did you learn? What did you learn? Who told you? What was left out? What was left unsaid? What I find is that oftentimes a lot of emotion comes up attached to these stories and memories. It might be feelings of anger. It might be feelings of sadness. It might be embarrassment it might be shame. So tend to those feelings. Don't push them away. Tend to them. Pay attention to them because they matter and they guide you to the next step, which is looking at what what might you do. So if, as you explore this question, you find yourself experiencing anger or sadness, I have two thoughts about that. One is that you get to now give yourself what you didn't have when you were little that you needed when you were little, when you were younger. So you might want to write a letter to your younger self, your kid self or your teenage self and write a letter to them, telling them, telling that little you what you wish you had been told when you were younger. And it's a nice way of healing, of sort of reparenting yourself from the inside out. You may even want to close your eyes and sort of imagine sitting down with your young self and talking to them about sex, about sexuality, about intimacy in a way that it wasn't talked to you, talked about with you when you were little. That's one option. The other thing to keep in mind is to that you your inheritance doesn't have to be your legacy, right? So how the people who are older than you taught you or talked to you or shaped you, certainly it left an imprint and there are echoes that still linger today, but you can transform that. And one way we transform and offer healing actually to ourselves is by ensuring that we take a different path with the people who are younger than us, the people who are coming up behind us. Maybe it's your, your children, your nieces and nephew, the young people who are part of your life. You can make a commitment to ensuring that how you model conversations about sex is different than how they were modeled for you. Question number two, what turns you on? This is another qu important question towards developing and deepening your sexual self-awareness. But question number two, what turns you on, starts with the question of, do you know when you are turned on? Do you know, what's the degree to which you know and understand what arousal feels like in your body? What turned on feels like inside your body? And for some of us, for a variety of reasons, that may be the place where we do our first work. If your initial experiences of sexuality were traumatic, it may be that, it's, that you need a journey of reconnecting to what arousal feels like in your body. If you grew up in a home where there was quite a bit of shame and taboo around sex, it may not feel safe or aligned for you to feel turned on, to let yourself feel turned on, to be okay with that. So the first thing that may need to happen are some practices around just noticing um, what arousal feels like in your body. And arousal, by the way, isn't just uh, an erection if you have a penis or being wet if you have a vulva. It's also a psychological state of mind, a sense of being open and eager and curious and willing and available. And sometimes we are in a state of arousal concordance where our bodies and our psyches are all lined up together. We feel arousal in our bodies and we are in a state where we are open to, available for, and sexual activity is available to us. But sometimes, very commonly, we are in a state called arousal non-concordance, where our bodies and our psyches aren't quite lined up. And that may look like um, feeling arousal in your body, but it's not the time or the place or the setting um, to express that arousal. The other way that arousal non-concordance can work is that we feel psychologically aroused, we feel interested, we feel curious, we feel pulled, but our bodies aren't there yet. Aren't there or aren't there yet. And it may be that we're blocked by shame, we're blocked because we don't feel particularly safe, we're blocked because we're anxious, or we're blocked because we just need some more time to warm up to a situation. So that's an important piece of understanding that there's arousal, but arousal isn't just what's happening physiologically, it's also what's happening emotionally and relationally. 
If you're growing edges that you need to learn a bit more about how erotic energy feels inside your body, having a practice of mindfulness can be really helpful. Uh, mindfulness just simply means paying attention to the present moment without judgment. It's just a practice of noticing, of paying attention. There are lots of mindfulness apps like Headspace and Simple Habit, and there are mindfulness books, and there's all kinds of resources out there about mindfulness. A very simple mindfulness practice is to pause during your day and just take an inventory that is based on your five senses. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? And what do you taste? Bringing your attention to just that in the moment awareness is grounding and it helps us learn how to notice what's happening around us and also inside of us. So mindfulness practices can also help you then be more attuned to your body and noticing how erotic energy feels inside your body. As you begin to understand more deeply what arousal feels like in your body, then you can get to the question of what turns me on. And a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is that you can pay attention to your sexual fantasies. Research by Dr. Justin Laymiller found that 95% of us have sexual fantasies. A sexual fantasy just means a sexual or erotically charged thought. But you can relate to your sexuality, relate to your sexual fantasies, sorry, relate to your sexual fantasies as if they are a text of sorts, a story of sorts, and you can notice what are the themes, what is the context, what are the situations that you find particularly intriguing or arousing. And having something that lives in your fantasy life may have little to nothing to do with what you actually want to enact in your real life, but there are clues embedded in your sexual fantasies that will um, give you a bit more of a uh, deepened awareness of your sexual self, a bit more connection to your sexual self. The final tool I suggest to you is something by Jaya Ma, and it's called the Erotic Blueprint. So she has created a survey that you can take on her website that helps you understand. It's sort of a different twist on um, Dr. Gary Chapman's love languages, but these are erotic blueprints, and it's about what do you find stimulating, what turns you on, what is it you're craving and seeking and drawn to uh, about a sexual um, experience. So that's another tool available for you to develop a, a deeper language and understanding about what draws you, what interests you um, in a sexual situation. Question number three is, why are you having sex? <laughs> this is the question about what's motivating you to enter a sexual space. What is it you're seeking or wanting from a sexual experience, the why. The why is about sexual desire. And this is a huge topic, uh, but what I will say about it today in this video is that there are, what researchers have found is that there are a couple of different kinds of sexual desire. Sexual desire, meaning the motivation to enter a sexual space, can basically be classified in two categories, spontaneous desire and responsive desire. Spontaneous desire is that your desire is triggered or stirred by internal cues that feel like horniness, right? The feeling like you, you want to be sexual, that that's, that's sort of an internal drive or motivation to be sexual and to, to reach for and um, work on creating and cultivating a sexual experience with somebody else or with yourself. Responsive desire is um, the kind of desire that gets kicked off or stirred by context. So it's not an internal cue that's the motivator. It's, the, it's desire that is sparked by contextual cues. Examples could be things like watching a movie that has some erotic content that triggers your desire. It might be a great conversation with your intimate partner that cues your sexual desire. It might be an awareness that your partner would like to be sexual with you that then kind of orients you to the fact that that actually might feel really good for you as well. So it's something, it means that your desire is sparked in response to a cue around you versus a feeling of being horny, pure and simple. And a lot of us have 
either kind of desire. Some of us have purely spontaneous desire. Some of us have purely responsive desire. Some of us may experience uh, either of these based on the context. What we know is really common is people who are in longer term sexually monogamous relationships tend to have more responsive desire. And it's a reminder that being part of, especially a sexually monogamous pairing, uh, that the work of being part of a couple like that is the work of cultivating desire. What is it that sparks and triggers and activates each of our sexual desires? Because part of being together is that the desire may early on in a relationship be much more spontaneous. And as the relationship is becomes more attached, more committed, more predictable, we need to do things to actively spark or cultivate desire. Which takes us to the other piece of this, which is understanding that our desire works on a dual control system. We have an accelerator and we have a brake. That's how desire works. And so an important piece of your sexual self-awareness is understanding what is it that activates my accelerator? What are the kinds of things that help me feel motivated and interested in having sex with my partner? And you can think about this in terms of the senses, in terms of the relational dynamic, in terms of your relationship with yourself. It could be anything. So really getting creative and noticing what are, the, what are the factors in the world around me that help me feel connected to and desirous of uh, intimate connection? And then what are the breaks? What are the things that really kind of cut me off from having access to my erotic energy? And understanding how desire works for you, it's idiosyncratic, it's yours, and it may change with time based on the status of your relationship, based on what's going on and in, in terms of who you are as a person. So checking in over time with your accelerators and your brakes is important for you to know within yourself, and it certainly is important in terms of uh, navigating sexuality in the context of an intimate relationship. There you have it, brave love warrior. Three questions that you can take and use to deepen your sexual self-awareness. How did I learn about sex? Why, what turns me on? And why am I having sex? And these three questions are based on this idea that you are entitled to sexual experiences that feel good to you, that enrich you, that elevate you, that connect you to yourself and your partner. For more on sexual self-awareness, watch the next video in the series.